Welcome to episode 548 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and things did get a little dicey there against Real Betis, but four goals is something to talk about. Has Barca turned a corner? Will I have a guest on the podcast this week? Will you be subscribing and checking out the Patreon and or merch store? I hope the answer to all of those questions is a big ol' yes, and I'll answer your next question then now. Can he jump into the five headlines already? Yeah. Let's get that started. Here's the five headlines from Barcelona's 4-2 win over Real Betis. Headline one is early game foreshadowing. Now, this is not part of the headline, but just to lay the preamble here, Andres Guardado gets the guard of honor with Joaquin and Sergio Canales. You know, I always heard from Frances Tomas when I started, I didn't know this. I learned this on the podcast myself, that the second favorite team of Real Betis fans is Barcelona. And historically, the second favorite team of Barcelona fans is Real Betis. So there is always some kind of synergy there. And I can say that probably over the last seven, eight years that Real Betis, maybe it's it's pretty close here because there are a lot of Real Madrid games that I have just sat out. But I think Real Betis might be the team that I have actually watched the most throughout the last, yeah, seven, eight, nine years in the Liga. They have been one of the more enjoyable. When I say that, they leak in goals, but they also score the goals. And while it has not necessarily been the case this year under Pellegrini, they've always been a fun side. And I do feel like it is a changing of the guard for them. While their identity, at least against Barcelona, again, the results outside of Barcelona have been different, but at least against Barcelona, the reality has been the same. And that's a good thing for Barcelona because, yes, Pellegrini won the game at the Camp Nou last season, but has lost 14 of 15 heading into the match. And, well, yeah, I guess I got back to the first headline there. Early game foreshadowing there. For the starting lineup, the one big surprise, but not really a surprise based on who was available. With Christensen picking up that knock midweek, that meant that it was Pau Gabarsi's time, unless Xavi wanted to get a little bit fancy because Cancelo wasn't around to play right back. So the options really were, is it Hector Ford at right back and Koundé and Araujo in the middle, or was it Kubarsi in the middle and Araujo and then Koundé, and Xavi opted for the latter. So that means a 16-year-old, 17 tomorrow, so maybe even by the time you're hearing this, 17, 16-year-old, whatever you want to say, Pau Gabarsi gets a start. Lamine Mall was the other 16-year-old starter, and I will be talking quite about him. And the reason why Headline 1 was early game foreshadowing was that it was a bright start from Lamine Mall. Two really nice moves in the first five minutes there, and he got the sense that Lamine Mall was beginning this game shot out of a cannon, and it really is the case with young players who are inconsistent. When they get started quickly, and, you know, his mind MLA was kind of the same way, where you go back to the match reviews from last season even, and I would say I knew between the first six to eight minutes of a match whether or not Dembele was going to be showing up. And I actually put Jao Felix in a similar category here, even coming off the bench. I know we'll get to it at the end, but I feel like this season you can tell in the first six to ten minutes of a match if Jao Felix is up to it or if he isn't. And while, again, Dembele, Felix, those are players that are like that because they're mercurial, because their ceiling is so high. When it comes to teenagers, it really does feel like they either have it on a day or they don't. And within the first few moments, I know that Lamine Mall had it. It was also a bright start from Balde, who reminds me, when he does start well like that, that he is still just 20. And he was doing some work against Luis Henrique and Hector Bellerin, not necessarily the best defenders in the Liga. So I am happy to see that Balde was willing to go right at him. Isco was also really bright to start for Real Betis for more foreshadowing. And it should not be understated. I'm not sure how much you've been paying attention, but it cannot be understated about his career renaissance this season. That free role means that Barcelona needed to constantly communicate as to where he was positioned on the field. You saw in the first half with Real Betis struggling, he was on the right. He was deep on the left. He was forward in the middle. He was trying to make runs in behind. He was dropping in, trying to do anything he could to put his fingerprints on the game in the first half. The other wrinkle that wasn't really a wrinkle because we've been seeing it for a few weeks now is that Young was dropping in between the center backs and then pushing farther forward than Gundogan with Gundogan then in buildup when they were in Betis' half of the field was the deeper midfielder. Gundogan also was farther forward after set pieces and then De Young would obviously step in to defend in those circumstances. Let's jump to the 14th minute here. De Young finds Pedri over the top, stayed onside but couldn't get on goal. And for two teams that throw so many punches and for a game that had six goals, that was really the first moment of the contest where a team was in on goal where you felt like, okay, this is going to have some fireworks. Headline two is the shark eats the scraps. Let's jump ahead to the 21st minute because we do have a lot of goals to go over in this match. So for that 1-0, 
a little bit of luck for Barcelona. Fortunate deflection here. And for all those times when I felt like Barcelona forwards weren't lucky, this is one of the times that they were. Though Barcelona, they were also fortunate farther back, not just a deflection here. Araujo had dribbled solo and affected the Betis press. I didn't see which Betis player it was, but Araujo had made contact. Either he stepped on or got somebody in the shoulder or the face and he tried to sell it. Ref didn't go for it. So that meant with a Real Betis player laboring, Gundogan had time on the ball where the Betis player was not collapsing to him in that mid block. So I do think Barcelona were a bit fortunate that Araujo wasn't called for a foul or they didn't look at it or anything like that, or they didn't even call it off for a foul in buildup. So VAR must have taken a look at it and said there was no foul there. And it also was a little bit before the goal as well. But anyway, Gundogan then tried to cross and the deflection, this is where the luck really comes into play. The deflection went perfectly to Pedri, who was making the run in half space. That is an example of making your own luck by making that run in the half space, something we have not seen a ton of while Pedri was out and Torres was just behind the ball and finished it easily. So yes, a bit of luck on that goal, but still Barcelona giving themselves the opportunity to succeed. 27th minute here, Lewandowski looked onside. It was a save anyway, but I really do just bring up this little moment because of Lamine Mall's through ball. Another example of Lamine Mall just having his day. And then a few saves from Iñaki Pena in the first half, but nothing really troubling him. Betty's having trouble finding the game in the first 45 minutes. Headline three is Lamine Yamal, the winner. Let's stay in the first half for just a minute more. 38th, Lamine Yamal hits another post, and he's been really unlucky this season with those posts. And you could say the same thing for Fermin Lopez, too. Just post after post after post. Instead of playing the ball in front of him, though, on this pass, the ball was played just behind him, where the defender couldn't reach it, and he did really well to collect it and set himself up for the shot. So instead of thinking about his next move, he collected the ball first, had the composure to hold off the man, and then get that shot off. And then Ferran Torres offside on the follow-up, even if he had put it in. 45th minute, offside, but how fun was this non-goal by the three forwards? Lamine Yamal had the fun, spun the defender, got it ahead to Lewandowski, to Torres, back to Lewandowski for the finish. It was also a solid performance in the first half by Kobarsi. Solid, just like Christensen. Very fairly conservative, playing as a right-footed center back on the left of that 3-2-5 in build-up. But in that first half, made really good decisions, some switches over to Koundé. And really got to see him in build-up more so to start the second half when Barcelona had some possession. And I want to remind you too, even though Barcelona were worse in the second half, and you know these Real Betis goals are coming, the second goal came after some prolonged pressure from Barca because they came out of the second half firing on all cylinders. The 2-0 scored with Lamine Mall doing the heavy lifting, a clean finish by Torres too. And it's another post as well for Lamine Mall. 1v1, he goes against Abner, another fortunate bounce for Barcelona, but still it had to be finished and Torres got all of the ball. Lamine Mall also, as I mentioned before, second time in the game, he winds up holding off. I think it was Abner on the first one. It might've been Socrates on that first one he held off, but it's Abner to get that shot slash cross off. Either way, hits the post, Torres finish, Barca up 2-0. Headline four, Isco's renaissance. Here is where it goes sideways for Barcelona. 54th minute, Real Betis had taken back control. And I want to remind you, even in the glory years, Barcelona did not have full control over games for 90 minutes. But also there were times when they did. Again, I always say any new fan, I send you back to the 2011 Champions League final against Manchester United. That is the first place I send you. That is what the epitome of control and because of the team that they were doing it against and the stage they were doing it against, that is the stuff of legends. That is what control for 90 minutes looks like. Even though Manchester United scored in that game, it was just complete control. And this version of Barcelona, I don't need to tell you, with Xavi, does not have control for even 70 minutes of most matches. There is a moment when the other team, it doesn't matter who they are, Adafe, Salta de Vigo... Sevilla, Real Betis, no matter who it is, you know that another team is going to get some bit of control or be on the front foot in a match. And it happened to Barcelona right around the 52nd minute, so not too long after the second goal was scored, unfortunately. 54th, headed off the line by Koundé, Peña and Borja Iglesias going up for it. Barcelona surviving at that moment, but that was followed up by another Betis attack. Fakir unloaded one, and Peña did well to stop it and keep it in front at that moment. But... Then, again, a minute later, 56 minute, 2-1, Peña and Araujo failed to clear it, and Isco got one back on the half volley. This was an absolutely superb 
finish by Isco. It's why he was voted the Liga man of the match, even though there was a player with a hat trick and another player who had two assists and five successful dribbles. I'm talking about Lamine Mall, but still for the double, they gave it to Esco. And while that was really special from Isco, this should never have even happened for Barcelona. It was another worrying miscommunication by Pena and Araujo. And that communication and command of Pena along his back line, that has troubled him throughout his whole career. Controlling things in the air has always been something that has been a problem for him all the way up through. Again, he is decent with his feet. I wouldn't say he is excellent to stay of all time, but Pena is above average, good enough with his feet. And I also think he's a good enough shot stopper, making saves with good enough reflexes. But his control of the air is below average. And it's another moment this season where his command in the air, his vocalizing, his communication has come up to be a problem for Barcelona. I still think that he's a very decent backup and could flourish as a number one somewhere. But at the level with the results that Barcelona are expecting, it'd be nice to see Ter Stegen come back sooner than later. Within three minutes, Isco strikes again, the 2-2. Isco flicking it over Pena. Very little the goalkeeper could do this time. Originally offside, but then De Jong was clearly playing him onside. There was an argument about Iglesias affecting play, but VAR disagreed and Barcelona had to move on. You've got to be mentally strong at that moment with 2-2. The big picture, I think, from those two goals is that Barcelona, as I said, always struggle when they don't have the ball. They are an elite team with the ball. You can see that not only in chance creation, but it is in the quality of the players. But without the ball, we know this team is largely average, maybe above average with all teams, but average when it comes to teams who are expecting to get far in the knockouts of the Champions League. And headline five is all out attack. 63rd minute, Lewandowski comes off for Vita Roque. And the reason why I probably need to do a, another podcast with a guest this week is because I don't really have time to talk about Lewandowski coming off in the 63rd minute and being the first substitute, but that is something to discuss. It is something to talk about unless we learn that Lewandowski had some kind of knock and it wasn't really up to him, but that's not what it looked like. He just for the 18-year-old Dieter Roque, and at this point too, Barcelona getting even younger. So at that point, you had a 21-year-old in Pedri, you had a 20-year-old in Balde, you had two 16-year-olds, and then you had an 18-year-old in Roque. I don't really have any other notes on Vita Roque other than this was not the cleanest showing from him. I'll just say that now. But as I said in that last match review, I'm going to be really patient with him this entire spring. I was corrected very fairly on the Portuguese, Spanish, and the language, how that may not be a major issue. But I do think after a full Brazilian season and getting up to speed in the European game and with a new team, tactics, and even the speed of playing with his teammates, it's going to take a little bit of time. I'm totally patient with Vitor Roque. All I know is the kid runs his butt off, and that's exactly why he entered this game in a wide open game. And he ran, created space, and that's all I wanted to see from him today. Let's talk about Kabarsi again here. He looked like he did need to come off after picking up a knock midway through that second half. He read Luis Enrique's run perfectly, but he may have been stepped on or may have caught his foot in the ground. He had to do more defending in the second half and also made a number of tackles, even when he had already asked to come out of the game. He was still calling for the sub in the 79th minute, coming back from a corner kick, finally goes down in the 80th. But if I had to sum up his performance in one word, it's composure. If there's anything you need to know about this player and where his ceiling lies, for what he is now and what he could be, a better version of Christensen, and I know he's not as tall yet, but he's just turning 17 tomorrow, so he still might grow. But I think the best version of Christensen is actually what the ceiling of Kabarsi looks like. He saw that Xavi trusted him to play as a left center back, and he's just so good on the ball. Technical ability is terrific. He makes the right pass with accuracy just about every time. And I do warn people who are obviously spamming how he's going to be Barca's next great center back, give him time on the other stuff. We don't know yet. And we'll know his actual ceiling in the future. We just don't know what the ceiling is. But this version of Pau Gabarsi at 16, it looks like a better version of Eric Garcia, what Eric Garcia was supposed to be for Xavi. And if he's able to add a little bit of height and some strength as well, Christensen looks like what his ceiling is. He's very good at being reactive to attackers and his positioning is also really, really good. Judging him against other 16-year-old center backs in world football, his ceiling is as high as anybody his age. With him picking up that knock, though, at that point, it was kind of worrisome because the game was opening up, as expected, once Betty scored the second. And Torres skied it to the moon, where Torres could have had his hat trick at that point. And then next, it was Lamini Mall over the top of that back line into Vita Roque, who couldn't keep it on target. 
71st minute, Pedri off for Fermin Lopez. And then in the 81st, Kubashi finally goes out. Joe Felix comes in for him, which means that Xavi had to switch things up. And why this headline is all out attack is because without the personnel, and the other option was to put in Hector Fort. So putting in another 17-year-old kid, and obviously if you need a goal, you want to put Joe Felix in instead of a 17-year-old and Hector Fort. I get that. And that meant that it was going to be De Young going back to center back, Fermi Lopez dropping a bit deeper, and Ferran Torres coming into the midfield basically as a 10 with Joe Felix and Vita Roque in front. But this was a bit of a worry immediately because Torres was pretty gassed at that point, and he wasn't the only one. And good on Xavi for realizing that immediately that Ferran Torres did not have the gas left to come back and defend. So that formation change in the 81st minute changed almost immediately and became a 4-4-2 instead with Vitor Roque and Torres up top and Jal Felix as a left midfielder. Maybe that was the initial call. It took them a bit to settle into it. But if Xavi did recognize that immediately and then change up his game plan, that's a big credit to him. And that change worked. Barcelona survived. Two stop its time. Here comes the 90th minute, the 3-2. This is great work by Jao Felix. Fermi Lopez started the move from the wing. Gundogan to Felix to Torres and back to Felix. But the finish was a special part of this goal. Perfect bend, perfect power, perfect goal, perfect moment for the Portuguese player who this is one of those appearances that you put in the positive pot. And I do really feel like Jao Felix and whether or not he's going to be a Barcelona player next season, almost like Lewandowski at this moment, but can save me that for the podcast tomorrow. I think of it of two different pots or cups that you want to say. Every good performance, because I do really feel like Michel Felix, very much like Dembele, all of his performances either fall into the good or bad camp. I, I feel like there isn't a lot of average in the middle. He either has it or he doesn't. And after every performance, I feel like maybe the club does the same thing I do, where you put a performance in the good pot or good cup or the bad pot or the bad cup. And if he has not even more good... But if the good cup by the end of the season winds up overflowing and you say there was just too much good, you've got to take a chance on him, then he'll be a Barcelona player next season. But if that cup of the bad performances surely outweighs on the scale, I'm losing my metaphor, but if it outweighs on the scale, the good cup, then you decide to not bring him back. And that's the way it's going to be. 92nd minute, 4-2. What a pass here by Lamine Mall. And we don't see 90 minutes from Lamine Mall very often because you do want to protect him. So I do hope that he gets a rest and it's Ferran Torres, Jao Felix, and Lewandowski or Mark Gu, whoever it is, starting midweek against Athletic Club and Lamine Mall gets the rest. I do feel like Lamine Mall did play 90 today because Lewandowski, Ferran Torres, and Jao Felix will be the starters for Athletic Club. And Xavi is already looking ahead to that match, which is a good piece of managing to have... 90 from the medium all in a game that really suited him, where he wasn't getting chopped down, it wasn't overtly physical, it wasn't overtly intense, and there was a lot, a lot of space for him to run into. The fourth goal comes, Barca defending the corner, and as I said, Lamini Mall threads the needle for Ferran Torres between the two Betis defenders who flicked the keeper, that being Ferran Torres, and got his hat trick. Ferran Torres now has 11 goals and 4 assists from 19 appearances in just over 1,500 minutes, regularly being used as a sub for the first half of the season. Numbers-wise, I would ask you, What is the expectation for him, and is he meeting it? I think 11 goals at this point in the season for Ferran Torres, for a player who was completely lost and who had lost all of his confidence earlier this season and last season, 11 goals in 1,500 minutes, largely coming off the bench, that sounds gosh darn fine to me. So I do think that the questions throughout this summer should be about Lewandowski and Zal Felix. And regardless of how the rest of this season goes for Ferran Torres, yes, of course, if he continues like this, he'll quiet all the questions. But with the first half that he even put in for a player, quote-unquote, without confidence, I don't really have that many questions for Ferran Torres come the summer based on his contract and what he makes on his wages. Those two goals meant the very important points Barcelona seven points off Real Madrid, who were top at the moment of recording, but also at the moment of recording, Girona have just put three very quickly past Sevilla, so who knows how that game ends, but it looks like Girona's in the driver's seat. That means it's going to be eight points off Girona, and in terms of Almerio Real Madrid, I don't have time to talk about them. Maybe it'll come up tomorrow, and I'll let you tell me what you think of it before you get my feedback on that one, but I think you know where I sit. But for Barcelona, as I said, these are three really important points here. And what's also important is you continue to help me out here, Twitter, Instagram, and also my personal Twitter account. It's Hilton D13 on Twitter or X or whatever. I'm close to 2,000 followers, so it'd be pretty cool if you're not following me on social media. Follow my personal account. Help me get to 2,000. I don't know. On X, it's all broken, and I don't care too much about it. But it's a nice little number that keeps me going, right? 
Patreon, close Facebook group, Discord. That's how you get further involved in the community. And of course, a good rating on the podcast app, subscribing to the YouTube channel, a huge help as well. Most importantly, though, thanks for listening to the five headlines. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Forza Barca. Thank you.